This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with Iranian-American artist YZ Kami. Kami has gained notoriety over the last four decades with his large-scale portraits of faces in contemplation, as well as a variety of other bodies of work which explore themes related to spirituality and the architecture of sacred spaces through both figuration and abstraction. In the conversation, we discuss the commonalities in his diverse body of work and what could be seen at his latest exhibition in New York. And now, a conversation about the night and day with artist YZ Kami. YZ Kami, thank you so much for joining me today on the Art Sense podcast. Um, Kam- Kami, you know, normally I-, I like to start with artists with the uh, with a hypothetical, which is. Let's say you're sitting down at a dinner party next to someone who has no idea who you are or what your work looks like. How do you start to describe your work to to a stranger? Yes. Um, uh, first of all, I would say that uh, I'm a painter and I've been painting since I was a child. So that has been, you know, the center of my life. Uh, ever since uh, I was a young boy. And um, the mo- main main um, center of my work, if, they, if I'm asked by that guest at the dinner table that, what do you paint? My first answer is that I, I paint portraits. And, uh, but as you know, I paint also the other things. But portraiture, and human being face has been the center of my work ever since I remember. And uh, my mother was a painter, and um, and I grew up where I grew up in Tehran was um, there was always her studio, and uh, her, she was more of like a academic, like sort of. Uh, uh, portraiture, still lives, and uh, landscape paintings. Uh, very academic, but very well done. And uh, anyhow, I started to paint, and uh, from very early on, uh, I would say five, six, seven years old, and uh, I have already said that the, the reason I wanted to paint was to be able to paint human face. So human face um, was always the center of my interest in art, and I mean, in in painting. And um, this is how I started, and I continue. But then the other things started to develop also along the way. For a lot of people that think of your work one of the things that first comes to mind is scale, right? The scale of your portraits aren't exactly the scale of the portraits that your your mother would have been painting back in Tehran, correct? Yes. For years, uh, my portraits were the size of like human head or a little smaller. Uh, I can say from childhood until uh, I came to United States in the in the eighties, they were um, small paintings, and I always used a sitter in front of me in order to paint her or him his portrait. And when I came to America in the eighties. Although I had seen already very large portraits in uh, churches, in Byzantine churches, I mean, in Hagia Sophia or in uh, uh, Torcello, you know, those huge uh, frescoes uh, or mosaics uh, of, um, you know, saints and um, uh, Jesus and uh, Mary. Anyhow, but when I came to New York, I saw for the first time 
very large portraits done by contemporary artists. Uh, and the first one that uh, I was stunned by was when I went to Metropolitan Museum in New York and I saw uh, the portrait of Mao by uh, Andy Warhol, which is a huge painting. Uh, it's not there anymore for many years. I mean, it's back probably to the, uh, to the collector of the work. So that was uh, the first, my first encounter with a very large portrait in contemporary art. And I got very taken by that. And um, I decided to, to try to paint in my own way and my own style, but in a different size, in, in a much larger uh, proportions. So then I realized that it's not possible to use a theater. Is you know, a small face in front of you sitting there and then this huge canvas of like eight feet tall is impossible. So then that is when I started to use photograph photography, meaning to uh, have the picture of a head in, in front of me looking at and trying to, you know, first draw it and then trying to paint it. And... Uh, and it was marvelous. It was such a, it was such a, uh, how would you say, liberation and freedom because then I started to take like large brushes instead of those very small brushes. I could have like larger gestures, I mean, to paint the face. I mean, not like the cooning gestures, but you know, much freer than what I used to do in the, those small, uh, meticulous uh, portraits. And um, this was um, like a huge freedom that uh, uh, happened. And then ever since uh, I used this large format, but also... Actually, the show that you mentioned that is going to open at Gagosian next week, uh, the portrait are not, there are two series of work in that exhibition. One is like some portraits and one is a, a number of those night paintings, but the portraits are not very, very large. Uh, I mean, they're much larger than human size, but are not like eight feet high or, uh, or 10 feet high. And um, anyhow, that's how it happened that I, you know, enlarged the size of the canvas. And, uh, but then I went back to also smaller scales during all these years. Uh, so after that experience, even the smaller scales became different. You know, there was something that uh, liberated in the process uh, that was very very interesting for myself. I've heard you speak about inspiration that you drew from Roman Fayum mummy portraits. And I know that your your large scale portraits, originally the eyes were looking straight ahead like to kind of engage the viewer. But more commonly now, the, the eyes are... Um, are not directly interacting with the viewer. The, the the eyes are, you know, many times looking down. Can can you kind of talk about how that has evolved in your work over the years? Uh, yes, you know, for many years I I uh, used to ask the sitter to look at me while I was painting him or her, and then, as you mentioned, when I was a student in Paris. I discovered uh, the Fayum portraits, those Roman Egyptian uh, second, third century portraits that the Louvre, the Museum Louvre has a fabulous collection of those. And uh, when, I uh, when I encountered those portraits, it was like a fantastic revelation. It was all these stylized, huge eyes looking at you. And um, and they were painted to be the later um, 
put on the on the sacrifice and, and the mummy of the uh, of the person and uh, those were really uh, had a huge impact on me and uh, accentuated this uh, desire to have the eyes staring at you and become like a um the absolute focus of the painting but something happened that uh, something around 20 years ago i would say like somewhere 2003-2005 i started uh, to uh, to, uh, to to ask the sitter for to, to have a you know to have either eyes closed or the gaze down that uh, can convey a sense of um, meditation or contemplation or like introspection. And uh, that was very interesting because it changed a lot. You know, before that, the eyes were always the focus and I started the painting with the eyes and I spent as much as time I could on the eyes and then gradually I expanded to the rest of the face and the painting. But uh, with eyes closed, isn't that goes away. That window is closed and then the whole surface of the face becomes, you know, the focal point of your, your attention. And uh, to paint the, 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 was a different experience. And at the same time that the, the gaze went down uh, in the paintings, in the faces, um, the painting started to become, that happened very naturally, started to become a little soft and blurry the edges became a bit blurry they were as if there is like a tremor or a movement uh, on the uh, surface of the painting um and then uh, ever since now I, I mean but ever since i've been painting both um, uh, faces with closed eye and the gaze down and also gazes at you like in this uh, exhibition they're both uh... you had invited me to to come have this conversation in your studio and i'm i'm really sorry that uh, i the schedule just didn't allow me to to be there to see the the work in person but my understanding uh from looking at the work it, it looks like uh, Many times you're working on top of uh, like a terracotta colored ground, right? Which reminds me a lot of how icon painters would uh, go through the process of making uh, making icons. There would be this uh, terracotta colored bole that would be under the gold leaf, right? Yeah. And, you know, I just wonder if, if that's just uh, a coincidence that the, these images that kind of communicate, you know, obviously icons communicate like a call to worship, but, you know, there is a level of spirituality that's being conveyed in your work. Is it just a coincidence that you, you happen to also be working on a similar ground? Uh, no, it's not a coincidence. To, to use uh, terracotta as a ground is uh, it was not it was a lot in it was used a lot in uh, uh, Byzantine icons and uh, medieval icons, but also uh, in um, in uh, classic European paintings, uh, like you know you have portraits, uh, for instance, unfinished portraits of Goya. There are some that you can see that the, the background is terracotta. It's something that has been used in um, uh, since Renaissance uh, in a different part of uh, Europe uh, as a background. And um, I tried it many years ago, uh, and uh, it suited me a lot. So for the, you know, the gray became like more... Uh, warmer or something like that. But then for the past um, uh, few years, um, 
actually I uh, I abandoned uh, terracotta uh, to gray background, like a um, medium gray. Uh, so the paintings you will see at uh, at this exhibition at Gagosian, the the background um, to paint on is uh, I prepared the certain tonality of gray. In in those paintings where you you were using the terracotta as as a ground, um, it's it's almost like you were leaving a hint of that across the bottom on many of those paintings, and I believe there's a, there was one um, I believe is uh, uh, the particular sitter was named Isaac where it's it's almost like you left all of that terracotta yes. exposed. Um, and I believe that same model shows up in your new show, uh, but in uh, but in full color. I, I think it's is it Isaac in purple shirt. Uh, yes, yes, correct, correct. That's absolutely true. I did uh, in Isaac. Uh, that also was just happened. Uh, the, the background was terracotta that I painted on, but then uh, I started to paint the face on it. And then I decided that uh, I thought it looks nice to keep the terracotta. And uh, I, uh, yeah, I, the rest, the whole rest of the painting is uh, that uh, terracotta. And in these um, new paintings, uh, this new show, there is one portrait uh, of a woman in a dark sweater that the background is also a very intense terracotta. But that terracotta, I painted over a gray. Um, but, you know, as opposed to uh, Isaac, that face of Isaac was painted on top of the ter terracotta background. Well, you know, it, it makes me think, you know, from your perspective as, as an artist who's had a great deal of success in, in notoriety, it seems to me that you don't confine yourself to some set of rules. I mean, you. I feel like some artists could say, well, this is the recipe, this is the process that I've always used, and an artist can wind up being confined by their own success. But it seems like you have made a lot of room in your practice for experimentation and breaking your own rules. Would you agree? Yes, I do. Uh, that has always been the case. And, uh, you know, because I I do not follow, I mean, there are some uh, basic technical matters that I've been, I've developed through years and uh, through my practice, but, uh, but um, I, I do not follow a, you know, a, a program or a formula. I, you know, I always say the image comes to me and then I follow the image uh, or the emotion that comes, I follow it. Uh, that's why you see so different aspects in my work that you mentioned, like you have all the portraits, but you have also these uh, years of those, uh, those like geometric, uh, abstract geometric architectural, uh, you know, works on of domes and collages and endless prayers. And then uh, for the past several years, these uh, paintings that I call them night paintings that are basically abstract. And uh, so, uh, yes, I will, I don't think is experimentation is not that I decide to experiment different things, is rather uh, to follow uh, follow things that they come to me. That being said, how did you arrive at the night paintings? Was it purely an experience with indigo and wanting to play more with it? Or, or what What was the, the catalyst that uh, had those paintings come about? Um, you know, around like probably seven, seven, eight years ago, um, I was reading uh, 
William Blake poetry again after many years, after my student years. And, uh, and some images, some imagery was keep on coming to me that were not at all, uh, or uh, I didn't think it were connected to Blake's poet, poems, nor to his uh, visual work that had nothing to do. And um, so these images uh, sort of abstract with light and uh, darkness, and they keep coming to me. And I, for a while, I just ignored them because they had nothing to do with my work nothing to do with my portraits nor with my abstract work like dome series and the, those things and then uh, after a while i i started to make sketches and uh, of them and then i started to use those sketches and then in uh, photoshop with the help of a, someone who was knowledgeable in photoshop to make them more concrete in uh, using technology, and then uh, started to print the, what happened in those. And then um, I started to make paintings. And I used um, uh, that also very instinctively. I used the indigo and uh, the color indigo, oil color of indigo. And um, they're all painted only with indigo and white, obviously. So you have the different shade of indigo, some of the areas that are very, very dark. You, you almost think they're black. And uh, some are lighter blue. And uh, then I read actually somewhere that uh, indigo is considered as the color of the night um, in a moonless sky. And um, then I decided to call them night paintings, although they're all painted during the day, but uh, <laughs> they're night paintings and they're abstract and is not about night, is a, a mental state, is an inner state. Uh, I cannot describe which kind of, uh, inner state is that, but is uh, these movements uh, and these uh, uh, forms that they appear and then they, they dissolve and uh, uh, yes, is a mental night, but night not in a uh, not in a dark sense, you know, because there is also lots of light in these paintings. Are there any domes or endless prayer works as part of this uh, show that's coming up at, uh, at Gagosian? No, there isn't. But uh, there is uh, one portrait of an uh, uh, Asian-American uh, man, a young man, who is he's in front of a black dome. I mean, that you see, yeah, as a background, his background uh, is just part of the a dome, you see, but his background is a black dome. So is that the first time you've kind of combined those two bodies of work? Yes, yes. A portrait in front of a dome is the first time I've done that, yes. Wow, that's really interesting. You know, just this week, I had a conversation with uh, a guest from my podcast who wrote uh, a book about... Uh, the language of symbols in art and art history. And I always find it very interesting, you know, the kind of the universal symbol, the kind of the collective unconscious worldwide that we kind of associate with circles and concentric circles, how it's in many cases, it's tied to the heavens, whereas a, a square is kind of tied to the earth and you know, it's across all of these different cultures, across different religions, you know, whether it's, you know, Buddhists, um, you know, thinking of circumambulating stupas or, or whatever. The, these abstract works, I mean, they, they do kind of have an underpinning of spirituality to them, correct? 
Well, yes, absolutely. You know, this this the the circles, uh, uh, concentric circles, and uh, and my dome and endless prayer paintings and collages. You know, these are very basic uh, mandalas. Uh, and mandalas are, as you said, they're universal. You find them in Asia, you find them in Middle East, in Europe, in, you know, South America, are very primordial, basic image of uh, of the soul, I don't know how you call it, which word to use, uh, that are universal. And um, and my dome series, I, I, I think they are very simplified mandalas, but they refer to domes. Uh, the origin of it comes from the very first time that I did that was a photographic work uh, that, um, of two domes of two different mausoleums uh, in Iran. Uh, one has a, uh, uh, the, the center is open so you can see light and one is totally dark, the center. So I uh, did two very large, like 10 feet by nine feet uh, works. I cut the photographs in pieces and I mounted them on canvas and it was only showed once was in a exhibition uh, was at an exhibition in uh, at MoMA a Museum of Modern Art New York called uh, Architecture as Metaphor and uh, it's called Untitled Diptych and um, they're like it's a diptych that is for a corner so they are when you see them you see both of them in an angle and one is light at the center, one is darkness. And uh, this is the very first time I use this circular imagery and comes from architecture. And dome is like, is like a symbol of the, you know, of heavens, because that's like the ceiling of the temple or the ceiling of the church or the uh, whatever. And, um, but my domes, I mean, the domes paintings are actually uh, not domes in the actual sense because the domes, they have a perspective. You know, the, the center of the dome is far from you inside the cupola, and then gradually the elements, the mosaics or the pricks, they become larger and larger. But in the dome paintings, they are all the same size from the center till the edge of the canvas or the edge of the paper is the circles are circles are all the same size and the elements meaning the bricks or the mosaics painted are the same size that gives the idea of uh, you know the infinity this could go on and on to infinite there is no structure to you know perspective that it stops. Um, so that is uh, used in uh, also by collage, by cutting. Uh, I use also by cutting pieces uh, of paper, written prayers or poetry in different languages, in Persian, in uh, in uh, Hebrew, in uh, Arabic, in San Sanskrit, to, and then make these mandalas, very simple mandalas, uh, that I call them endless prayers. Uh, the origin of it for me was <clears throat> that photographic work that I mentioned to you, and then after that I did a sculpture uh, called uh, uh, Rumi, the book of Shams the Tabrizi, uh, which is out of soapstone, again, circles uh, and concentric circles uh, of soapstone. Uh, these were origin of this series. And then I did, you know, collages and I continue to make those paintings of uh, domes in white or 
some some of them I use gold leaf, some of them are blue. So the the endless prayers are collage comprised of text printed on on rice paper, but I you know your collage work also includes you know projects that you've used photography, whether that's um, you know of a, of a particular place, you know, architecture, maybe even including you know a person. Can you talk a little bit about your your photo collages? Architecture has always been, I've always been very interested in architecture. And uh, as a teenager growing up in Iran, I, I traveled there uh, uh, with my parents or to, I saw some, you know, old architecture that I was very uh, taken by. Also the Byzantine and uh, like, you know, some medieval architectures in Europe that I've seen also during that time. And uh, was a very, uh, I had a, I always felt very connected with the space and uh, and specifically the sacred architecture in different traditions. And uh, so the photographic work of architecture and space that started in the 90s, while I was also painting portraits, and um, they all dealt with very simple images of, uh, you know, like bricks, this I mentioned to you that ceilings or, you know, just walls, and uh, again, very simplified uh, architectural facades, but all connected mostly connected to sacred architecture. A couple of months ago, I had uh, Shirin Nashat on the podcast, and it was very interesting to talk to her about her journey being uh, an Iranian in exile here, how her work has always kind of tried to process not only her own journey, but the the state of women in Iran and, you know, it was interesting hearing that after being here for uh, more than 40 years, she's beginning to kind of come into her own identity as an Iranian-American. You know, being someone who grew up one place and has lived for 40 years someplace else, I, I imagine you can identify with that. What what has your journey been like in drawing inspiration from your culture in trying to you know figure out what your identity is here in the U.S. Um, you know, I left Iran when I was 17 years old, and I was for like 10 years student in Paris, and then after that, in the 80s, mid 80s, I came to New York, and ever since uh, I live in New York and. New York, I call it home. I've been living here almost, you know, 38 years. But I always, the fact that I'm an Iranian and I grew up there was with me ever since. I mean, I, it never abandoned me. I When I left in Iran in the mid-late 70s, I was uh, reading my favorite Persian poets always, and uh, that has never stopped. You know, I was reading Hafez in the 80s, in the 70s, or Rumi, the 70s, early 80s, late 80s, 2000, last night. I mean, what I carry inside, meaning my visual experiences, my emotional experiences, meaning all my childhood and teenage years, and um, my, the culture that I grew up in, which was a both Western and Eastern, because my family was also very exposed to, to the West, has always been with me. So I never felt um, that many people might feel that uh, there was like a cut, because uh, what I experienced uh, growing up Iran, in Iran never left me. All my work comes from that and also everything else that I was exposed to ever since. You know, there, there was one last piece that uh, I wanted to ask you about, and you've, you've made a, several of these, and that's called The Messenger. Yes. 
you know, I think the interesting thing about The Messenger is that, you know, we talked about your early portraits kind of engaging the viewer, you know, looking into a, a viewer's eyes, and then the, the other body of them, they're looking down. The Messenger, you know, we're, we're seeing the back of this person, right? What is the inspiration behind The Messenger? Is that um, that comes from a picture that I took many years ago, uh, probably 15 years ago or something, in a, in a trip in southern India. Uh, after someone was on a road and going away, and I, from and I could see only his back. He's yeah, I think it was a man. I took uh, a picture, and that picture. I kept it for years and um, then I put it on the wall of my studio and I always wanted to do something with it. And this is last year that I started to do the first painting of. Uh, I changed the environment uh, and uh, his garment somehow. uh, And uh, uh, the first one was a small small paint, smaller painting and uh, the way when it was changed the, the, the landscape looked uh, more like it could be africa and, uh, or it could be also southeast asia south asia or southeast asia and uh, and the figure is going towards the that landscape and between the landscape and the figure there is a road that has, there's a lot of light. These are things that I changed and I, I added to the, to the image, uh, full of light. So a friend of mine saw and s- said, oh, this is Dante, he's going towards that landscape, that forest. And then another friend thought this is going towards light. Uh, Anyhow, it's very mysterious. It's like uh, I called it messenger, and um, uh, and he has a stick. And uh, if you ask me, what is his message? This messenger, what is his message? I I don't know. But uh, again, a, a friend mentioned that it, it, this is messenger of love, and I like that. But you know, it, it strikes me that it's um, it's very open ended in that it, there is the capability of you know of people inserting their own narratives in there. Even for you, I mean, you you know where that image was taken, but you've kind of created a scenario for it where you know it could be a, a Bedouin in uh, North Africa, or, or it could be. Uh, a Mahatma in India or, you know, a shepherd in Ethiopia, right? I mean, it's like... Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, or Eastern Africa. Uh, it, it is, yeah, it is. It could be It could be any of those places. Kami, uh, you know, I believe, if I, if I have the dates right, uh, the show is going to be up at Gagosian. Uh, the show is called Night and Day. And the show is going to be up January 17th to February 25th at Gagosian's um, West 24th Street location. Exactly. Um, and this is this is your first uh, solo show in New York in, in almost a decade, right? Uh, the last time was January uh, 2014. I had a show at Gagosian, a solo show at Gagosian uh, on Madison Avenue. Madison, uh, 980 Madison. This is uh, my first uh, solo exhibition in New York for after nine years, and actually is the very first time I'm I'm showing in Chelsea, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, you know, Kami, I I really appreciate your time. Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, being willing to to talk about your work and explain. Yeah all of the, the wonderful nuances and subtle references in your work. And I hope that uh, the show goes quite well. And I really appreciate you making yourself available today. I hope you will see the show. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to Art Sense. 
You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.